Joining us now is OGLP with stories trending around the world. Hello, Jenica. Good morning, Dr. Lady Martin. in yellow in with yellow. a touch of black. You got that right. Yes, yes. Today is uh, <laughs> it's my good day. I got all the colors right. Oh, you did? Yes. What is that color? Blue now. Oh. What else? Good job. <laughs> what is it? It's aqua blue. Yeah. <laughs> good morning, Tundu. How are you? <laughs> good morning, Rafai. Audrey, I really think we should start a color show. Yes, we, we're already doing it. We're a doing color it. Show. <laughs> it's a compliment color show. Compliment color show. Just starting. Good yes. Morning, How are you? Good morning, Rafai. I'm doing well. Very well. You're looking great. Thank you. Yeah. Good morning to you, viewers. Here are some of the stories that are trending across the globe. United Kingdom. Queen Elizabeth, the world's oldest monarch, turns 95 today. There will be no public celebrations as the occasion comes just days after the Queen bade farewell to Prince Philip, a husband of seven decades, at his funeral. In the United States, protesters gathered in Ohio's largest city after police released body camera footage of the shooting of 16-year-old Makia Bryan. The incident comes as the nation is focused on the guilty verdict of Derek Chauvin, former Minneapolis police officer charged with murdering George Floyd. Third degree murder, perpetrating an eminently dangerous act, find the defendant guilty. And footage of a World War II era plane landing off the coast of Cocoa Beach in Florida has made the round. Oh. In Thailand, a 68 year old Buddhist monk reportedly chops off his own head with a guillotine in the hope it will lead to being reincarnated as a higher spiritual being. In Nigeria, a bill to create a national database for livestock passed its second reading at the Senate and has set Twitter a buzz. Under sports, British Nigerian heavyweight champion Anthony Joshua formally invites Floyd Mayweather and Vladimir Klitschko to train with him ahead of his mega fight with Tyson Fury. Finally, on our entertainment, Marvel Studios has released the trailer for its first Asian superhero film, Shang-Chi, The Legend of the Ten Rings. We make a good team! Well, let's begin what's trending in Nigeria. The Minister of Information and Culture, Lai Mohammed, has reacted to the United Kingdom's decision to grant asylum to persecuted members of the proscribed indigenous people of Biafra and the movement for the actualization of the sovereign state of Biafra, Masob. On Tuesday, the minister said the decision amounts to sabotaging the fight against terrorism and disrespects Nigeria as a nation. The decision of the United Kingdom to grant asylum falls within the new guidelines of the United Kingdom's visa and immigration rules on how to treat asylum applications by members of Biafra's secessionist groups. Rufai, I believe that IPOB have responded to this um, decision mm. and they have, you know, they have thanked the United Kingdom, but they obviously declined it because what they seek is really not asylum, but a sovereign Biafra state. Your take on the story. I mean, this has been on for a while, the, the push for a sovereign state of Biafra. Uh, let's not forget that we fought a war as regards this in the 60s. We made efforts at healing, no victor, no vanquish. But the factors that caused the war are still rife in our faces now as we speak today. We had an interview not quite long with Aya Adebanjo, and he made some very salient points. Not necessarily all I agree with him. The fact that the country is still very marginalized across many lines, there are agitations here and there, there's a way we should look at the constitution that has not been done. The fact that Nigeria functioned better as federating units back in the days and regional systems. And that's why we're having the offshoot of all of this. In the first place, if we are fair to one another, we shouldn't have agitations like this in the first place. If we continue with you know, the regional system, if it wasn't turned into a unitary system after, you know, the coup and what happened in the 60s. We shouldn't be having what we are having today. So this agitation, and as it is in other parts of the country, is because of the fact that something needs to be done. So for me, 
I think it's a clarion call. If we're trying to build one strong Nigeria, we should build a Nigeria where people are seeking asylum in other parts of the world. We should build a Nigeria that is inclusive with justice. And that's what we keep calling for. When you check every part of the country, there's agitation. The question we should be asking, why are we having these agitations? We're talking about Sunday Go in the South. We're talking about Biafra. We're talking about other parts of the country. But we should build a country that is inclusive, that works for everybody. And how can we do that? It's when we rejig the format at which we're even working together in the first place. So it's a bigger talk, bigger than the case of oh, asylum seeking and the UK talking about all of this. It is a call on us to build our country with fairness and having great conversations. And where does it start from? Reviewing the recommendations in the Sovereign National Conference we had in 2014 that is there wasting away. Because in 2014, we called every part of this country to come together and talk of how the future of the country will be. And we did talk. And we did make recommendations. So the question is, are we leaving those recommendations behind? Because we need to make this country one, work one way or the other. So the information minister here can be upset about the fact that asylum is being granted to IPOB members. But the question we should ask ourselves is this. If we truly have a country that works for all, are we, are, do, do we need to get to this level where there's so much violence in every part of the country? See what's happening in the East. See what's happening in the West. Everywhere you turn to in this country, there's violence. The reason why we have this violence, because of the injustice, the, iniquity, the, the iniquities, I should use that word, over the years, the fact of marginalization, the fact that this country works for some, it doesn't work for some. That's why we have 33% unemployment. So it cuts across all. And this is the time leadership should stand tall. I always use the word rise up twice at stall to be able to tackle the problems we are facing so that we don't derail the country. All right. <clears throat> what are the issues involved here? The issues are as follows. One. The UK Visas and Immigrant uh, Department, the consular office, as it were, declared in new guidelines that persecuted members of the indigenous peoples of Biafra will be granted asylum, visas, right, if they are persecuted. Now, the position of the uh, United Kingdom is consistent with the 1956 uh, UN uh, Convention on uh, Refugees and the 1967 Protocol which removes geographical and time limits from the original 1956 convention. And the issue is about human rights. It's not about IPOP as an organization. It's about individual rights, human rights. And what the principle under the 1956 convention says about asylum is that if you are in a country, whether you're a member of IPOP or you're a member of any group, if you are persecuted, then the international community will come to your rescue and offer you refuge. So to that extent, I do not think that the United Kingdom has committed any offense uh, that requires the kind of emotional response that came from the minister. Second issue, the Minister of Information of Nigeria says, well, if the UK is now going to be granting asylum to uh, members of uh, IPOB, not as an organization, persecuted members, then it means that the UK is sabotaging Nigeria, the UK is encouraging terrorism in Nigeria, and he also pointed out that IPOP is a proscribed organization. Yes. But he made one very instructive point. He said, well, this is not within his purview. It falls within the purview of the uh, Minister of uh, Foreign Affairs. And there are established protocols uh, in uh, customary international law if a country wants to object to a step taken by another country. The 1956 convention uh, is not absolute. He says that once you can establish that that particular individual who is seeking asylum has committed crime against peace, has committed crime against UN protocols, then of course you can raise an objection. So if Nigeria is going to raise an objection, it's not at a news agency of Nigeria forum where the minister is uh, giving uh, you know, a speech. It will be something that will follow you know, uh, protocols within international, customary international uh, law. Now, uh, what is the issue? Again, the third issue that remains is simply that anybody can apply for asylum, whether you are a member of IPOP or not. 
okay, as long as it's within that con uh, convention. And the whole issue is about, as I said earlier, human rights. And that's why that 1956 convention is managed, is overseen by the United Nations Commission for Human Rights. So um, as far as I'm concerned, the minister has expressed an opinion, which anybody can uh, express. But specific issues will be dealt with on a case-by-case -case basis, Correct. and whether or not Nigeria uh, makes an ob objection. However, we should all remember that consular rights are domiciled within the province of the country that is issuing visa, or that is adopting Im immigrants, or that is uh, granting asylum. It's not a thing that Nigeria can dictate to another country under the principles of sovereignty. No, sir, Dr. Batichindu. Well, absolutely not. Nigeria cannot dictate. And the idea is not that if you're in IPOB or MASOB, you get asylum. No. All the cases will be examined on their merits, and then a decision will be made. It's not about if you're being prosecuted in your country, come here. It's about if you're being persecuted. And the minister is doing, I suppose, what he's expected to do, expressing his umbrage at this. But, you know, I have front row um, experience of being a political prisoner and dealing with all of that. At that time in Nigeria, Ni the Nigerian government, the Abacha um, regime, took umbrage against um, other countries that were giving safe harbor to persecuted Nigerians who fled for their lives. So I have the same reaction in this re regard. They have no right to come out with this kind of a statement. There are people who feel persecuted, and the right to life is sacrosanct. If you feel that your life is in danger because 150 members of IPOD were killed in this country, you have the right to leave. Absolutely. The um, Namdi Kanu, a political prisoner, I'm sorry, he didn't kill or kidnap. He was held for a year and a half without trial as a political prisoner. It is unacceptable, and All that right. is just a fact of the matter. If the Nigerian government insists on pretending, sticking their heads in the sand like an ostrich, pretending that we operate a level playing field, this is a note to them to see that other people are not convinced, other people are not persuaded. There is the impression that is very real that Nigeria is sympathetic to some people and unsympathetic to others, unfairly so. We have somebody sitting in the cabinet today who was saying that unbelievers should be killed. He's delighted when, what was that nonsense he was saying, that hateful rhetoric? He says he has recanted. Yeah, but he did say it. And he has repented. But he did say it. He and deserves a plate of yeah. jollof rice. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. So that, that impression is there. I would urge the federal government to look within and to correct that. Absolutely. And the IPUB message is also clear to the United Kingdom. Thank you, but no thank you. We don't want to be residents of the United Kingdom. We want to be citizens of Biafra. Correct. So I would urge the federal government to address why their citizens are all attempting to jump ship and work on that rather than pointing fingers. Very well said, guys. Before we take our next story, we'll have to go on a short break. And when we return, what's trending on the morning show will continue. Stay with us. Welcome back to the morning show. We're still on what's trending. Reactions have trailed the 144 police officers from Nigeria that were sent to Somalia to boost stabilization efforts in the country. The police operation coordinator of the African Union mission in Somalia said the officers will work on providing VIP escort and protection services, training and assisting the Somalia police force, conducting joint patrols with their Somali counterparts and securing key government installations and high-level events. Well, Nigerians have shared mixed reactions. Let's stick a tweet from Gumenta, who wrote, meanwhile, Many are being killed daily in Nigeria, with many in refugee camps. Bandits and Boko Haram have seized communities. Muhammad Buhari, charity begins at home. Additionally, sending troops to Somalia is like sending troops to Afghanistan. Endless wars, waste of resources. Endless wars, waste of resources. Tundu, your take on the story. This had better be false. <laughs> I mean, surely. I'm completely baffled. Because what we're told is that we don't have enough police officers in Nigeria. That's what we're told. That we have 372,000 for our whole, you know, 250 million Nigerians, which I'm sure that's even the wrong number. And out of that 372,000, we have 150 guarding VIPs, which the Inspector General of Police <laughs> has asked for them to be withdrawn on at least two occasions that I, I can recall, and there has been no such withdrawal. All the VIPs that I know still have their police force. So I'm going to do some maths here. 
150,000 to VIPs plus 144 yes. to Somalia. That is 294 police officers minus 372,000. So we have 78,000 police officers left in Nigeria, in the 36 states of Nigeria. I mean, this is, this is ridiculous. This Quite has to be a lie. No, it's not a lie, oh Dr. Fati. Well, <laughs> very quickly, I mean, this is one of the big ironies that we deal with in Nigeria. And Tundo has pointed out one part of it, that we do not have uh, enough uh, policemen in Nigeria, and we're sending people to other parts of the world. Second, uh, Nigerians also express concern about the fact that what we do not have at home, uh, we tend to give uh, to That's the other people. Everywhere. Whereas the basic principle is that you cannot give what you do not have. Never so that. that's uh, another irony there. However, if we want to be uh, truthful, uh, in 50 years, since 1960, Nigeria has been uh, actively involved in peacekeeping operations. And it's been one area of major achievement, particularly for this same Nigeria police force that we criticize. We've been able to send over 12,000 personnel on ECOWAS, AU, and United Nations missions. And ironically, again, Nigeria has always, Nigerians have always distinguished themselves in these uh, international peacekeeping operations whether it's in East Timor, <laughs> uh, or Bangladesh, or Kosovo, or Guinea-Bissau, or Sierra Leone, or Liberia, or Namibia, or Mozambique, this, or Sudan, or South Sudan, these are some of the countries we've been to. In fact, we were also involved in the operation in Afghanistan. And many of our people, you know, they win awards abroad, but at home, they don't, uh, they don't uh, perform very well. The first time Nigeria took part in peacekeeping operation was in 1960, the mission the Nigerian police force mission that was led by ACP as it then was, as then Commissioner of Police as it then was, Louis Edet. And we went to Congo and we did very well. Even Nigerian soldiers went there. Okay, the question is, why is it that the Nigerian police force does well abroad and does not do well at home? And I've had uh, many Nigerians cynically commenting that, okay, the Nigerian policemen, uh, 144 of them, going to uh, uh, Somalia and they've been told that they are going there to mentor the Somalia police. Did you, did you what kind of monitoring are they going to uh, uh, provide? People have asked, are they going to promote police brutality? Are they going yeah. to teach the Somali police how to collect bribes? How to uh, ask for, <laughs> you know, is there anything for us? Uh, what is inside your boot? You know, so I think the sum total of the reaction is that the Nigerian police leadership, now we have a man there called Usman Al-Kali Baba, you know, you should take all of this in and understand the fact that the Nigerian police has a public relations crisis. Nigerians are very cynical about it, and they think that, uh, you know, we're exporting some kind of virus uh, to Somalia. That's very unfortunate, considering the record of the Nigerian police force in terms of international peacekeeping, uh, where, you know, many of our people have distinguished themselves and won many international awards. Rufai, do you think that the Nigerian police is going to go to Somalia to ask, is there anything for us? Are they going to teach the Somalian police that? <laughs> no, they're, they're not going to ask, is there anything for us? And the, re and the reason why they do well is because you can't compare the way UN will pay them their daily allowance and the way they are paid in this part of the world. So there's a big disparity. The reason why they do well in peacekeeping, and in fact, they look forward to it. If you ask an average police officer, does he want to go on a peacekeeping mission like this? He'll say yes. Why? Because he will get paid, probably in Forex, and he will be getting, giving better welfare than what is obtainable at home. So the question is, how can we improve the better welfare? And secondly, how can we add to the police force? Because like Tudu did the mathematics, if we only have only 78,000 police officers remaining, that does not go in consonance with the UN regulation that says you must have a certain amount of police officers for your population, for right. about 1,000 people in your population. What makes the difference here is the welfare. It's because when they are under these missions, they are paid well in accordance with their other compatriots from other parts of the world. So the question is, how can we bring in this? The Nigerian police, the reason why he resorts to corruption and bribery is because corruption is for the top. I was talking to a DPO the other day that wrote a quotation for a friend of mine for his police station to fix their van because they said nothing comes from the top to their police station. Ask what's the budget for police stations in this country? How many police stations do we have? What budget comes to police stations in this country? Almost next to nothing. 
Somebody, a DPO in a state, told me in confidence that the only thing that have come to them, their police station, is the 30,000 naira the governor shared when he came to power. That they hardly get something. They only get what to run their station when they do stop and search on the road. And do you know that the money they collect from checkpoints as bribery and corruption, he gets back to the bosses too. So let's not come out here and act like, oh, it's all terrible. Are we funding the police properly? That's why they want to go for peacekeeping missions abroad, oh, despite the fact we don't have enough police officers here. <laughs> so we should All fix right. our problems internally. All right, reply. We'll take our final story. Popular Nigerian evangelical pastor TB Joshua has called on his followers to pray for YouTube after the platform blocked his channel with allegations of hate speech against the LGBTQ community. The preacher had posted a video on his YouTube channel, the Synagogue Church of All Nations, which has nearly 2 million subscribers claiming to cure gay members of his congregation of their sexuality. Last week, YouTube deactivated the account, and the preacher said he has appealed their decision, while YouTube's community guidelines prohibits hate speech and remove flagged videos and comments that violate their policies. Tundu, I'll go with you on the story. This man is asking for his congregation to pray for YouTube. I mean, maybe that would help them, but they have terminated his account. It is completely uncalled for. The things that he has been posting on social media platforms is not just this comment that he made. He's also been seen slapping members of his congregations who he believe are gay or lesbians. I mean... Mm, that is awful. Yeah. Because um, this is the issue with the whole um, homosexual... Um, praying away the gay, they call yes. it. Or pray the gay away, yeah. yes. You're presupposing that it's a choice. It's, mm -hmm. You're treating it like it's some kind of a bad habit rather than a sexual orientation that is actually legitimate, same as other people. You know, I'm not homophobic at all. I and I do that. despair that in Africa we do think in this way and we do need to move on from it. I know in the West they used to actually have people and shock them you know, trying to shock the gay, like torturing people to stop them from being gay. It is wrong. It is so bad. It should not be encouraged. It should not be accepted. So him asking his congregation to pray for YouTube is in order, but he should also pray for himself <laughs> and to accept people as they are. Absolutely. It's wrong. It's just Absolutely. wrong. Dr. Abati? Well, what we know is that the Joshua ministries have said that they will uh, appeal uh, the suspension of that particular channel, which had uh, over 1.8 million uh, subscribers. Mm -hmm. And they've launched another YouTube channel, which within 24 hours got 27,000 uh, subscribers. But what everyone should know is that the position of the pastor may not be objected to uh, in an evangelical country uh, like Nigeria. Oh, no, uh, and, a... and you know that there is a he law does. in place, same-sex prohibition, um, same-sex marriage prohibition bill of 2014, uh, which in any case has not been tested. But there's a lot of homophobia in Nigeria. There Thank is. you very much, Eugene. Thank you, Dr.